Anyways, ain't very all all that liberal to be. Wow, I mean it's a beautiful evening. There are many things you could be doing, and we totally fill up this place and an overflow room to talk policy. I love being from Massachusetts. We like we like the Trump message of America. We like the Trump message of getting jobs, getting the economy stimulated, getting getting health care taken care of. You know, I mean, Obamacare was failing. And, and nobody wants to talk about that. Instead, they want to talk about how bad the new health care plan is. Yeah. Well, if the other one's going to fail, then why even have a health care plan if it's not going to work? It's like, I don't know. It's really comes down to simple. I just don't like it. I called up a few of my, a few of my family members because my family's all for Trump. I just want to say a word about my job. Um, I see my job as going to Washington every single week and fighting for working families. That's it. This is not much of America needs a positive message right now. They don't need they don't need Pocahontas telling us that, you know, how she's with the common man and she's a millionaire. And but she acts she acts like she's one of us. And she's not. Now granted Trump's a billionaire, we get it, but at least he cares about what we care about. I never thought I would be in politics. I grew up in a working family. I grew up in a family that didn't have much. And I was a baby. I have I have uh, three older brothers. And I learned a lot from my older brothers. In fact, they keep telling me everything you learned, you learned from us. Um, yeah, thanks for, you know, I appreciate it, guys. Um, but it is true. I did learn a lot from my brothers. Um, all three of my brothers uh, are veterans. Uh, my oldest brother, Don Reed, was career military and 288 combat missions in Vietnam. And he taught me, we honor our <laughs> My second brother, John. Um, John, uh, after he got out of the service, he worked construction. Uh, and for part of that time, uh, he was a union member, and that's why he has a pension. And he taught me that unions built America's middle class in New York. <laughs> I, 
Yeah, he used to try to corral the neighborhood kids so we could play school. They were fast, though. It just, you know. Um, so I would line up my dollies, you know, because they were slow. Uh, and I gotta tell you, it was tough being one of my dolls when I was growing up. You know, I'd line them up, I'd get hand out books. I said, I don't think you did your homework last night. Um, you can't flip it, you're not prepared. Um, but it's all I ever wanted, was to be a public school teacher. And by the time I was a senior in high school, my family didn't have the money for college education, much less money to send me to school. And I got a scholarship, I dropped out of school, I got married young. Mm. Um, I got a second chance, and my, my chance was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. back in the United States Senator, it's right there. I am the daughter of a janitor who ended up as a professor at Harvard Law School and a United States Senator because America invested in kids like me. And I am grateful to <laughs> the lens of what does it mean to work with families, what does it mean for creating more opportunities for our kids. And there are a lot of pieces and parts to that. And I just want to start by mentioning two that are on the front burner, and then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, including more about these. But I want to say a word about how worried I am about the efforts to change the healthcare system in America. You know, I can't even call this a healthcare bill. This is a tax cut bill that is being funded on the backs of knocking 24 million people off their health care coverage, raising costs for working families, raising costs for people over 50, and opening the door, opening the door to discrimination against people with pre-existing conditions, discrimination against people who have mental health problems, discrimination against people who are suffering from addiction and need treatment, um, and all to produce a tax cut for a handful of millionaires and billionaires. That is not how we make healthcare better in America. And it is a fight I am in all the way. And that I feel like everyone in America has to be in all the way. We've just reached a point in our country where I think we just have to stop and say, look, healthcare is a basic human right. And the second thing I want to say is that's a fight that scares me, it worries me. Uh, the Republicans right now, they're meeting behind closed doors. They won't let the Democrats in to talk about it. Uh, and I'm very worried about where we're headed. But I want to tell you, it's not all bad news in Washington. In this latest round of budget negotiations, and we got a budget together to go from here until next September, there's a little piece buried in there. Um, as the negotiations were going forward and we were able to get out and talk to people and kind of figure out that uh, I'll just be blunt, the other side had decided they did not want to shut down the government, which we thought was a good thing. Um, but it meant we talked about some of the things we wanted to see in the budget. And I was able to round up 19 other senators on the Democratic side and put as much of the kind of shoulder to the wheel as you could to get an extra $100 million in opioid funding. So we have more to do. And I'll mention another one that is near and dear to everybody who lives in Massachusetts and everybody who is sick, has been sick, loves someone who is sick, has been sick, or might ever be sick in the future. <laughs> and that is that the original budget proposal was to cut $1.2 billion out of medical research this year. I mean, just think about that. You know, I don't even know how you cut a billion two out of already ongoing projects. But in the course of these negotiations, and we got enough senators to, to stand strong on this, we got a $2 billion increase in NIH. So, that's a little bit about what's happened. It tells you about some of the really scary parts. It tells you about parts where we're working 
together. We, I've got more examples of it. But why don't we do some questions, and that way I'm talking about whatever it is you want me to be talking about tonight. All right. Thank you. Yes, my question. First of all, I want to thank you for coming here and for talking Yes. Or to look into the activities that have been going on with the Russia, Russian situation. Who ultimately makes the decision? How is that person vetted? And how can we be assured that they will have no ties to the current administration? All right. What transition team? So, thank you very much for the question. Let's talk a little bit about this. I thought someone might raise it this evening. So, let's start with this. Uh, I think that there are two principal issues that we need to worry about uh, with where we are right now with Donald Trump firing uh, the head of the FBI. And the first is a basic issue about rule of law, that no one in the United States gets to fire the person who's investigating. That's just not how it works. It's everybody follows the law, investigations are separate and independent. Everyone knows this. It's true in your town, this is true in our commonwealth, this is true across the country, and it is true for the President of the United States. So, we need someone to investigate what happened and what is happening between Russia, the Trump campaign, and Donald Trump himself. Someone who is independent, who cannot be fired, who has adequate resources, and not partisan, this is not about Democrats or Republicans or anyone. This is about getting to the bottom of the investigation. And it's very important to be a transparent process so we can all have confidence in it. Look, it may be at the end of the day that there's nothing there. If that's the case, then that's the case. It may be that there's criminal activity at the bottom of this. But either way, every year, Democrat, Republican, Independent, every American should want to know what the right answer is, what the truth is. And to do that, I believe we start with a special prosecutor. Uh, we start with someone who is specially set out to do that. Now, this one, this one really will. You know, it's like you couldn't write a movie script like this. The person who would appoint a special prosecutor under current law the Attorney General of the United States, <laughs> who, as you know, is recused from having anything to do with any of the investigation with Russia because he's the one who lied to Congress about it and has said he would recuse himself, although I do notice that he is in the chain in terms of firing the director of the FBI. Um, so that means it would go to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States the person who wrote the letter that went to the Attorney General, that went to Donald Trump. So we do have a bit of a challenge here. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer two things because you asked. I'll be wonky to say there are two things because you asked. First one is, we could ask the Deputy Attorney General to do it and, and just see who the person is, who, who he would come up with. The second is, if you just simply go to the highest career officer, somebody that's not a political appointee of any kind, uh, doesn't owe any loyalty to one party or the other to come up with someone. The third possibility here is Congress can simply name someone. That's going to take Democrats and Republicans to make that happen. But that's certainly a direction that I'll take any, right now, any of those, but we have got to push for an independent prosecutor. Let me say one more thing about this, though. A lot of people are comparing this to Richard Nixon, uh, when Nixon tried to fire the people who were investigating and it did not work out well for Richard Nixon. Um, but keep in mind on this one, this isn't just about campaign illegalities. This one is about national security. This is about a hostile foreign government that has developed a new weapon. And the weapon is interfering with the democratic process. And they started it in Europe, not here in the United States, started interfering with elections there, came over to the United States, and this part, this is not partisan. Our entire intelligence community has said that the Russians 
hacked into American systems in order to influence the outcome of the election in 2016. And then, just last week, we saw that they hacked into the French systems and were brazen about it. I mean, didn't even try hard to hide it. And then got picked up by Joel Wright to try to magnify it. This is a weapon as surely as any bomb because it has a powerful impact on democracy. And that's why we both need to get to the bottom of what happened and we need to develop a strong, coherent response. This is not about politics. This is about American democracy and American security.